All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started introducing the Olios a little bit and just going over some quick logistical things so that we can jump into the meat of this in just a couple minutes while, and we can just go over the logistics while everybody finishes connecting. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, I'll leave this shared. My name is Sophie Richardson and I'm here with Arno Zimmern and E. Spencer who are the co-founders of the online Olios and also um, Olivia Branscombe, who's the mastermind behind today's session. And then today's panelists, Laura Dragescu and Lynn Maxwell, uh, will introduce all of them more officially when we get to their papers in just a few minutes. Um, first, I'd like to, before we introduce them, just go over um, our game plan for today. And then I'll turn things over to our panelists. Uh, so right now, just a couple words of introduction from me right now, uh, and then I'll hand things over to Olivia to talk a little bit about why this panel, why this topic, why philosophy, why gender, why combining them, um, so that we can kind of think about the questions animating the whole session as we hear from different presenters. Then we'll have our three panelists. We'll have Olivia, then Laura, then Lynn. Um, I'm really excited for these. I think they're going to be great. Uh, after we hear from all of them, we're going to have about a five minute break, and then you can have stretch, get some tea, do whatever you need to do, uh, and start thinking about questions and comments and ideas to discuss in the second half of the section. Also at that point, we'll give you instructions when we get to that, but if there's a particular breakout room that you want, uh, we'll arrange all of that during this five minute break. Then we'll have um, a few minutes, more than a few minutes, 20-ish minutes, is that what we usually do? Uh, in the breakout rooms, with the panelists to talk about whatever little nodes really caught your attention, really excited you. And then we'll return to the whole room and hear from all of our panelists and have a more full um, sort of digested Q&A with strands from everybody's breakout rooms and everyone's interests and everyone's panel presentations. Uh, so that's our agenda for today, and then we'll be continuing with more panelists on the same topic, but different approaches tomorrow. So we really hope you can come join us for that as well, because I think the conversation is only going to get richer as we throw more and more stuff into the stew. Um, the online OLEOs, those of you who I'll give a quick introduction because many of you have joined us before, um, but this is the digital arm of the International Margaret Cavendish Society and Digital Cavendish, who've been helping us. Um, it's an initiative that Arno, Ian, and I started uh, last fall as a way to stand in for the conferences that we were missing and also to uh, bring in people from more, more career stages, more parts of the world, really make use of the fact that we can be online and that we can have all these different conversations on really specific topics that get us excited that might be too narrow to focus a whole conference around, but that we're very excited we can draw in people from all over the world to talk about for a few hours on a weekend. Um, so the person we really want to hear from today is Olivia. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce her. Um, Olivia Branscombe is a PhD candidate in the Department of Philosophy at Columbia University. We're very excited to have philosophers with us in addition to lit people today. Uh, her research focuses on the metaphysics of Margaret Cavendish and Anne Conway, especially their views in fundamental ontology and the philosophy of mind. In her dissertation, Olivia argues that reading Cavendish and Conway as panpsychists and vital materialists highlights their contributions to 17th century debates, uh, particularly mind-body problems, while showing their relevance to ongoing conversations in aesthetics, the philosophy of mind, and social philosophy. Uh, Olivia is also an artist and podca the podcast producer, um, and she thinks it's important to take seriously the many ways philosophy happens outside of the prose essay genre. And I hope one of those many ways is uh, the webinar genre. And we're really, really excited to hear from you today, Olivia. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to you. And we would love to hear about this webinar and then uh, would love to hear your presentation. Thank you so much, Sophie. Should I go ahead and share my screen or should I just wait until it's time for my presentation? I'll wait till it's time for my presentation. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much to the co-founders and to all of our attendees. And then of course, to my wonderful fellow panelists. Um, I'm so happy to be here and I'm so happy to have everybody 
to hear from everybody. I think it's going to be a really fun and um, informative time. So thank you so much. Um, after the co-founders reached out to me about participating in this year's Olios, I wanted to take the opportunity to think about Margaret Cavendish and Anne Conway from a somewhat new to me perspective. So typically I work on their ideas about mind and matter. I also have serious interests in the philosophy of art and have spent time thinking about Cavendish's views on art and artifice. But for this panel, which I also wanted to be interdisciplinary, I decided to focus on Cavendish's views on women and gender partly because of a personal interest and partly because this topic encompasses questions and approaches spanning different disciplines. So there are people writing about this in philosophy, literary studies and history um, in a way that I feel is very fruitful. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity there for conversations to happen um, or to be continued. So in my own case, I became interested in this issue when I started writing about Cavendish's natural philosophy, especially her panpsychism, what I consider to be her panpsychism as a resource for 21st century environmental thought. Um, while Cavendish's natural philosophy is in so many ways anti-hierarchical, I noticed what seemed to me to be a kind of tension between the potential of her metaphysics on the one hand, and then the things she actually writes about women on the other. Um, and I wanted to know what, if anything, we can learn about her views on gender from looking specifically at her natural philosophy. Um, not instead of, but alongside some of her claims about women in human society that arise, you know, in her writings about herself, but also in some of her other contributions in different genres. So as you'll hear, I talk a bit about Conway in this presentation as well, but I have a lot of ideas that didn't make it into the final cut just because I wanted to respect everyone's time. So if anyone's interested in discussing this or bringing Conway into the conversation after the panel, presentations or just another time, let me know because I'd love to talk more about that. So that's where I'm coming from in terms of my interest in this topic for this panel. And then my rationale for inviting my fellow pa panelists was pretty simple. So I just wondered who was thinking about both gender and natural philosophy or who was working on gender in Cavendish outside of philosophy, but in a way that resonated with me and my philosophical interests or that seemed sort of recognizably philosophical um, in a sense. So, and I also wanted to bring together people from different stages in their careers because I think that that's a really exciting aspect of the Olio project. So then I just invited them to take the prompt and run with it. And I'm really looking forward to hearing their presentations. So in my own talk, I acknowledge the need for interdisciplinary work but also because of time and the need to keep things somewhat concise, my presentation is fairly philosophy oriented. I talk about Cavendish's natural philosophical writings for the most part, and I mostly refer to secondary sources within philosophy. So because of that, I'm delighted that my fellow panelists are taking an expansive approach to the idea that I put to them. And I, I have here in my notes that I think we are all going to learn a lot, but I'll say, I know I'm going to learn a lot in this weekend sessions. And I think I'll stop there since I'm the first person to present and I don't want to bore you or eat into my own time. All right, so now I will share my screen. And just to confirm, the only thing that's being shared is the PowerPoint, correct? Okay, excellent. All right. When perusing the secondary literature on Cavendish and gender, two tropes come up again and again. The question of whether or not Cavendish was a feminist and the claim that scholars have been divided on this subject. And I think the second claim is true enough. Um, around the 1980s, there seemed to be an explosion of enthusiasm for reading Cavendish as a kind of radical feminist. Um, some people use those that term specifically. But by now, that reading seems to be out of fashion or sorry, comment. Or who seem want to defend feminists against tractors. And I think that this makes sense. Cavendish's feminist credentials 
been called into question because of her apparent royalism and general norms, has a long history of being dismissed, mocked, not taken seriously. To read her mind in her saying worth taking seriously, those rejections, not even of her views, but looks like we're just having a few technical issues um hopefully she yeah there we go i'm going to move into a different room where i have a better internet connection apologize everyone beauties of technology has its affordances and also would you like me to take over while you do the shift or i'm sorry would you like me to be the one who takes on the presentation since you just barely started i could do the first presentation and then you could you could be the second if that that works better for you what do you think i think so i've moved locations i think this oh, okay. should be better um if it happens again why don't we just go to that option so that we don't waste more time but i want to try to keep going but um but yeah if i get kicked out again then laura that would be great thank you okay and Olivia, just for our ease, um, you weren't too far in. So if it's possible to start over, there was a little bit of audio issues. Perfect. I did see the ominous warning that my internet connection was unstable. Okay. All right. I'm in the room with my dogs, so I'm sorry if they make noise. Okay. When perusing the secondary literature on Cavendish and gender, two themes come up again and again. So there's the question of whether or not Cavendish was a feminist and the assertion that scholars have been divided on the subject. And I think that the second claim is true enough. Around the 1980s, there was this great enthusiasm for reading Cavendish as a kind of quote unquote radical feminist. But by now that uncritical reading is out of fashion and in its place are those who tend to debunk Cavendish's feminism or who seem to want to defend Cavendish the feminist against her detractors. And I think this also makes sense because not only have Cavendish's feminist credentials been called into question because of her apparent, apparent royalism and general approval of certain social norms, but she also has a history of being dismissed as a thinker, not taken seriously. And to readers who find in her something worth taking seriously, those rejections, which sometimes feel like they're not even of her views, but are just of her as someone who even has views that we should care to look through, accept or reject at all, can really sting. And the fact also remains that as a prolific writer in the 17th century, Cavendish was an extraordinary woman. So it's therefore completely understandable that we interpreters turn to her as a resource for interesting views about women and might even expect her, or wish that she would, hold political views more radical than the ones she really seemed to espouse. However, I worry that all this discussion about Cavendish's feminism, and even her views on gender more broadly, have gotten a little ahead of themselves. Because Cavendish wrote so much, and in so many different genres, it's all too easy, and it's even practically necessary for reasons of feasibility, to pick and choose the several texts that most clearly suit a particular scholar's orientation. And as I said in my introduction, this presentation today is certainly um, you know, an example of that. And in my own home discipline philosophy, Cavendish's natural philosophical texts are almost always prioritized over her plays and other writings. The work of Karen Detlefson is a notable exception to this. She's argued in several places that Cavendish's plays should be considered equally valuable philosophical sources as her explicitly philosophical writings, as is the very good work that's been done by several philosophers on the blazing world and on Cavendish's poetry. Similarly, while scholars in other disciplines certainly do discuss Cavendish's work in 17th century science, treatments of her putative feminism almost always focus on places where she describes the lives and actions of human women whether in reference to herself in those philosophical writings in seeming asides rather than places where actual philosophy is being done or in works of fiction rather than her metaphysics. I agree with Deborah Boyle um, that as she wrote in 2013, 2018, quote, Cavendish's views on gender can be characterized with more precision than scholars have previously thought. 
particularly by examining Cavendish's natural philosophy, end quote. Since by the end of her career, Cavendish had produced a detailed metaphysical system, that system seems worth probing for its implications regarding gender. Unlike Boyle, who tends to argue that Cavendish is conservative or even negative about women, I suggest that Cavendish's ideas about individuation and non-hierarchical creature-creature relations offer the potential to think expansively about gender, even if Cavendish herself did not endorse doing this. But it's not yet entirely clear in the literature how individuation should be understood in Cavendish, marking an area for fruitful future study. And in the rest of this talk, I want to consider what a gendered subject is for Cavendish, asking along the way what gender is and how individuals get gendered. And I also offer my own tentative suggestion for one way of understanding Cavendish on gender, though, as I suggest, a lot more needs to be done. Okay, so I have here a slide that lists some important elements of Cavendish's philosophy as I see it. And I don't expect people to read through this, but I wanted to have it here in case anything that I mention is unfamiliar to any participants or people want um, a refresher on what I take to be some of the sort of core things going on here that are relevant to the talk that I'm giving. But I'm also just gonna say, um, attempt to summarize what I think are the really, really key things for what I'm gonna present. So in brief, Margaret Cavendish is a materialist about the natural world who suggests that everything in nature, including human minds, is composed of extended material stuff. She also thinks that all the material individuals in nature are rational, perceptive, and self-moving. So there's a quote on here. She says, I conceive of nature to be an infinite body, which by its own self-motion is divided into infinite parts, not single or indivisible parts, but parts of one continued body only discernible from each other by their proper figures caused by the changes of particular motions. Okay, I'm gonna to return to this slide just in case it's needed. Because of her panpsychism, plenism, and rejection of atomism, all features shared with Anne Conway, who I'll discuss briefly as a counterexample in a moment, the question of individuation is complicated for Cavendish. So thinking about plenism, that raises questions about how to draw the boundaries between individuals. You don't have the physical form as the principle of individuation that is there for Aristotelianism because it's not necessarily clear where the boundaries between physical individuals end and begin. Panpsychism, for example, makes it hard to see how infinitely many minded individuals could come together to compose one single individual with a seemingly coherent point of view. So I just mentioned these as examples of different ways that Cavendish's philosophy make individuation specifically the question of how we get the individuals that we interact with in everyday life, but also all the other individuals that she thinks exist. How do we get them metaphysically? How are they formed? Okay, so what do we know about how Cavendish understands individuation? One candidate is found in that quote from observations that I just read, self-motion is supposed to account for individuation. Jumping into gendered implications right away, Detlefsen remarks in a 2019 paper that this linkage of individuation and material self-motion suggests the worry that Cavendish might be something of a gender essentialist. So I think the thought there is that if mental capacities are linked to the figure and structure of a material body, then it's easy to see how, for example, features of women's bodies that differ from the bodies of men could dictate and limit women's capacities. So Detlefsen quickly challenges this worry by appealing to Cavendish's emphasis on education and its potential to improve women's rational functioning. But I think that Cavendish does sometimes endorse the view that physical differences correspond to limitations in reality. And in an unfortunate passage in Philosophical Letters, she suggests that people of different races are more or less intelligent on the whole because their bodies contain fewer, more or fewer divisions of rational matter. And to be fair, the really racist stuff here seems to come from Hobbes, but nevertheless, um, you know. Okay. So here it sounds like it's the quantity or maybe the <laughs> level of activity. Okay, sorry about that. Here it sounds like it's the quantity or maybe the level of activity of rational matter, not the particular shape of a person's body or the structure of the way that their matter is composed that dictates the relative capacity for reason or their rational ceiling, if you will. 
So what kinds of physical variations do correspond to variations in rationality, for example? It would seem that, though physical, the relevant differences are not structural. So what I'm trying to suggest is that it seems like rationality varies in accordance with the amount of rational matter, or as I said before, the level of activity of the rational matter. It's, it's a bit difficult to tell from the text. Inherent in the matter composing a particular structure. And I find it interesting and, and important to note that more often than not, Cavendish addresses structural difference, for example, the differences among bees and humans and birds, as sources of non-hierarchical, different but not unequal rational variation. And she even seems to celebrate the different knowledges of different kinds of creatures, and very clearly rejects the notion that human knowledge represents the peak of natural rationality. So here on my slides, they have a quote substantiating this. Um, and this is just one of many, many examples. This anti-hierarchical bent of Cavendish's philosophy is something I find extremely compelling. And it sets her apart from her contemporary and near philosophical neighbor, as I like to think of them, though they were not friends, and Conway. For Conway, who is also a vital materialist, so I argue, and panpsychist, the material form of, for example, a rock, reflects that individual's moral comportment. So like Cavendish, Conway rejects the annihilation of matter in creation, meaning that anything that dies will have its matter recycled into a new creaturely form. For Cavendish, it's not clear what governs this transformation or whether any um, principle of the identity is retained throughout those transformations. We might hear a little bit about this or be able to think productively about this um, during Laura's talk on fame. But for Conway, individuals ascend or descend the great chain of being with humans at the top in accordance with their goodness as judged by God. And their rationality and vitality track their place in the hierarchy. So I mentioned Conway here because even though in some respects Conway seems to assign a tremendous amount of resources and potential activity and rationality to things like rocks or things that seem very low in the natural order to us. In a very real sense, we can think of her rock as being less rational than a human being. Well, for Cavendish, she could say that there's an extremely rational rock, which has super active rational matter in it, or a lot of rational matter in it, that's more rational than some dull humans. So it's really quite striking and gives one the sense that Cavendish's metaphysics has the potential for some really radical conclusions. And I think that's part of what motivates this conversation about Cavendish as feminist. However, it is true that Cavendish retains some hierarchies within the human species, as suggested by that passage above. And one of the hierarchies she endorses in the rest of her writings seems to be that between men and women. Men are generally held to be more rational and capable than women, and she thinks they should be treated as such. And even some of her more socially imaginative literary texts can be read as bearing this out. So as our panels, or um, the Olio's co-founder e, e. Spencer has pointed out in a recent paper on Cavendish and education, some of her stories of women behaving in a masculine manner, or at least when it comes to matters of education and intellectual employment, and in death, sudden inexplicable death or subjugation through safe patriarchal marriage. So the moral seems to be, even if women are capable of going beyond the bounds of their social roles, bad things happen when they do. But I still think, I still have a question. So I'm still exercised by this question of how women are really differentiated from men in Cavendish's opinion. And where in the individuation process does gender become pertinent? What is it that makes one human being have a particular gender in the first place. I considered the possibility that gender is structural, somehow built into certain configurations of self-moving matter. And even if Cavendish were to think this, or one of us as a reader of Cavendish read her this way, it's unclear how the hierarchies that Cavendish endorses could develop off of that understanding of gender. Because as I said, in general, she's full of praise for the various capacities of differently structured individuals. So I'm gonna look at another passage on individuation to try and get clearer. And I'm not going to read this aloud because it's quite a long passage, 
But what I want to draw our attention to here is, first of all, the language of sociability that's throughout this passage. And um, also the significance of knowledge here. Okay, so it seems like this passage is suggesting that knowledge is important for individuation because individuating motions are retained or preserved thanks to the knowledge possessed by the creature's knowledge of the appropriate blueprint, blueprint or structure for it. Um, so might the notion of knowledge help us out here? Uh, Laura Georgescu, one of today's panelists, makes the case for self-knowledge as Cavendish's principle of individuation in a recent paper. And one thing that sets her reading apart is her rejection of the proposal, which we find in Boyle, but comes up in other places. I've even um, repeated it before, that self-knowledge amounts to, quote, knowledge of what the bit of matter is currently doing and should be doing. So emphasis on should. This link between self-knowledge and norms, what the bit of matter should do, threatens once again to bring gender essentialism in at the level of individuation. So one nice thing about Laura's proposal is that it allows us to have self-knowledge as a principle of individuation without then building back in this gender essentialism that seemed like it might have threatened to impinge on these more structural theories. Okay, so I have here in other words, according to Laura's reading, Self-knowledge doesn't guide one to behave in the manner appropriate to what one is. Instead, it is what marks the boundaries between me and I wrote my chair, but I'm on the couch, or me and my dog when, glad I wrote this one in, I'm begging her with my eyes not to bark in the middle of my presentation. This is not to suggest that norms do not play a significant role in Cavendish's philosophy. On the contrary, as many have rightly emphasized, Cavendish thinks that nature is generally orderly. Let's see. Nope. A quote that I have in my text, but which didn't make it onto the slides, is, quote, nature hath but one law, which is a wise law, to keep infinite matter in order and to keep so much peace as not to disturb the foundation of her government. Nature is not without disorder, though. And disorder, which manifests at various levels from disease to war, is actually necessary to produce the infinite variety that nature enjoys. Still, Nature's general orderliness suggests that society preserving norms are important to Cavendish. And indeed, as Detlefson points out, and the passage just cited exemplifies, Cavendish often uses metaphors of sociality and government to describe nature and natural parts. In different places, she goes as far as to call creatures themselves societies. So when peace is kept and things are going generally well, the corporeal figurative motions of creatures are happening in a regular way. Individuals are stably defined, and they relate to one another in peaceful and predictable ways. Insofar as gender is important to the functioning of certain societies, we may in this respect have reason to consider gendered norms as particularly relevant to individuals. But it's not clear that gender needs to be a static part of any individual's identity for Cavendish, or even that it makes sense for it to enter in at the level of identity formation in terms of individuation, except in those kinds of social contexts. Okay, so let me put some of this together. The question is something like whether gender is essential at the level of creaturely individuation in Cavendish's view. And I think this is important because we aren't getting the whole picture of her views on women and gender, not that there's only one picture, but maybe I'll say it enriches our picture of her understandings um, of women and gender. If we stay at the level of social description only, the level of social description that's apparent in her plays and other texts. I think these are valuable resources for like not only to learn about Cavendish, but they're valuable philosophical resources in their own right. But Cavendish was also a prolific natural philosopher. And I think that these categories of resources need to be read together. Um, so in other words, I think her metaphysics provides useful information when it comes to understanding her social and political philosophy and vice versa. So my suggestion, which is very much suggestive, not super well fleshed out in this presentation, is that for Cavendish, gender is not an essential aspect of a creature's identity. It doesn't happen or come about as part of the individuation process. Rather, it's in a way socially constructed. Now, this doesn't mean that for Cavendish, gender is not also natural, in the sense that for her, artifacts are part of nature. But 
it leaves room to argue that the social norms around gender are not nature's norms per se. Nature's norms promote orderliness, and in Cavendish's social and historical context, orderliness was promoted by sticking to traditional gender roles. There's a quote from Boyle where, that I think almost illustrates this. So she says, quote, some women may choose to follow nature's norms. Others might choose not to. Women who choose not to follow these norms are acting irregularly and unnaturally. And Cavendish suggests, though this may not be a defect from the perspective of nature as a whole, it is likely to be destructive and dangerous to the society of which the irregularly acting woman is a member." Close quote. But notice here how Boyle continues to characterize the relevant norms with respect to nature, even as she says that transgressing those norms is not bad for nature, but bad for society. So again, there's a sense in which anything artificial is part of nature for Cavendish, but might there be room to understand the relevant norms as being social norms that are also natural rather than sort of the core norms of nature? That's the step that I want to call into question. All right, for reasons mentioned all too briefly above, individuation is a tricky issue for Cavendish and for all monism and panpsychists, depending on how they understand monism. Looking closely at some plausible accounts of individuation in Cavendish suggests though, that gender is not an essential feature of individuals for her. And I hope this talk has raised the possibility that it is not clear or perhaps not fixed where gender happens to individuals for Cavendish perhaps because of the shifting complexities of her ontology. This doesn't answer, nor does it even ask, the question of whether Cavendish is a feminist. I think it's clear from the historical record that she did not advocate for the liberation of women in general, and any account of Cavendish as feminist will turn on tweaking the definition of feminism in amenable ways. Nevertheless, her metaphysics provides the potential for undermining fixed categories of gender identity, and this, it seems to me, is worth taking very seriously indeed. Thank you. And I apologize very much for the interruptions. Um, thank you so much, Olivia. My dog was very excited by the interruptions and wants to know who this dog is and if oh, they can no. play. And I had to explain the internet to her and now she's off sulking. Um, that was wonderful, thank you. It, lots of different ideas popping into my head that I'm excited to ask you about later. Um, but first, we have two more presentations. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and share the intro slide and I will let you do the talking, Olivia. Give me one second while this decides to open itself. Great, thank you, Sophie. So our next panelist is Laura Georgescu presenting a paper called Material Traces of Cavendishian Fame. So Laura Georgescu teaches in the Department of History of Philosophy at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Most of her work has looked at the intersections between metaphysics and science, particularly in the context of 17th century English natural philosophers. She's been working on Cavendish on and off for the past couple of years, and has recently published a paper on self-knowledge and perception in Cavendish in the journal Early Science and Medicine. Her work on Cavendish is part of a larger project on the metaphysics of bodies and matter, which focuses on shifts in the understandings of priority relations between the properties of bodies. Today, Laura will be focusing on reasons for Cavendish's preoccupation with fame, reasons which go back to her materialism and her precarious standpoint as a female writer. Um, thank you very much, Olivia, and thank you all for having me. I'm really sorry about my voice. I have a non-COVID related cold, so I'm sorry if somehow I'm not, um, you can't hear me very well. Today, I will be doing something which is not very typical of me. That is, I will not be, providing a PowerPoint, I will not uh, give a handout, and I will not argue for a claim. What I will do instead is just sort of give you some hints of some interesting ways of, I think, I hope, of thinking about Cavendish on fame. Along the way, I'll make claims that are going to be completely unsubstantiated, but I hope that at least they will incite some, or trigger some bit of thought, and maybe in the future someone will pick them up, or maybe I will be able at some point to develop them. With that being said, I'll start reading my text. So as we all know, Cavendish, is, Cavendish unapologetically claims with absolutely no sign of humbleness that she desires to be famous. This actually makes sense. Fame is, according to her, that by which an individual secures their literal continuation in existence. The disintegration of your bodily figure is not the literal, literal end of your existence as long as you live on in fame. 
in after memory, as she sometimes calls it. At least in Cavendish's early writings, not all creatures seem to enjoy this perk. Living in after memory is a distinctly human affair. In World's Olio, she makes the point straightforwardly. Dead men live in living men where beasts die without records of beasts. Adding that, I quote, those men that die in oblivion are beasts by nature. Notice how strong a claim this actually is. Men who die in oblivion are beasts by nature. The implications seem to me quite dramatic. Who will qualify as a human is not just a matter of some set of biological properties we might have or of our own specific form of rationality or of the presence of a soul. It is an achievement retrospective, retrospectively gained through fame. This makes living in others an essential property of whoever qualifies as human. Seen from this perspective, the striving for fame is something like a moral duty for everyone who aims to achieve humanity. If we take such considerations seriously, and there's a big if here, we gain new insights into how grave the injustices brought to women actually were in not allowing women to pursue fame, either in war, in politics, in writing, women were denied the right to achieve ultimately this form of humanity. No surprise then that Cavendish is adamant and unapologetic about the pursuit of fame. But how is fame supposed to work? What would it mean to continue to live in others? We might think the answer is straightforward in her case, authorial fame. But is it easy to attain authorship? Is it sufficient to frantically put words on paper, possibly in as many genres as you can experiment with so that you can make sure you maximize contagion in, of others' minds? In the preface uh, of the PPO, Cavendish makes the following plea, plea to her readers. I beseech my readers to be so charitable and just as not to bury my work in the monuments of other writers. But if they still bury them, let it be in their own dust or oblivion, for I had rather be forgotten than scrape acquaintance or insinuate myself into others' company. This isn't the only time she makes observations of this kind. She worries a lot about one's mind not being populated with the thoughts of others. She treats this possibility of one, as one of the pernicious effects of bookish learning and of acceptance of philosophical authority. Similarly, she self-declaratively approaches her place in the history of thought by obsessively signaling that and how she differs. She rarely, if ever, claims companionship with other idea with others' ideas. If being the subject of an intellectual biography or having your name on the cover of a book or defending an authority in writing would be enough to secure fame, we'd expect less existential worry about not being confounded or collapsed into the lineage of someone else's thought. For Cavendish, to really have her eternal memory, there needs to be a distinctive Cavendishian trace involved in the process. Now, what would this be? Cavendish's materialism might be of help here. On her account, a friend lives, in, lives on in me after their bodily disappearance through the presence of a copy of their figure in me. This figure of my friend is not their geometrical outer figure, nor is the entire bundle of their actions and traits. I simply couldn't have patterned this friend as a whole. I've always patterned them by parts. And the pattern parts will often, often be specificities or idiosyncrasies that my sensitive matter picked out and that my rational matter combined with its own tincture. The figure of my friend is, it, is in me a copy, but a copy in which my friend's relevance to me, how they matter to me, play the role in how their fi this figure is presented. In the 1663 PPO edition, Cavendish notes that throughout the duration of an act of patterning, the senses are somehow in pleasure or in, plain, or in pain. When an object is directly presented to the senses, the senses are not neutral and objective detectors of the objects of sense, but the senses themselves are affected by the act of patterning. 
this affectation stops when the object is removed. But this stopping on removal doesn't apply to minds. Because the mind can reflect on the thought made out of the sensed object, a pleasurable or painful uh, thought can last beyond its presence, the, the presence of the object. And the act of reflection on a pleasurable thought is itself pleasurable. We have here a sign of if Cavendish, the writer, is to attain fame. She has to incite something in the reader. A cold, mechanical, calculated, indifferent involvement with the texts would prevent her from living on in the minds of her readers. But this is, of course, insufficient and somewhat also intuitive. If Cavendish is to be famous, there have to be the distinctively genuine Cavendishian traces in her writing. In her protestations about fame, this is what she's actually looking for. The imaginative literary worlds are perhaps easily recorded as, their, as hers. But what do you do about philosophy? How does Cavendish attain a genuine Cavendishian philosophy? This is what she is after. Cavendish is also clear in how strong the impulse the striving to fame actually is. So strong, in fact, that it often makes one act imprudently, arrogantly, or worse, hubristically. The vicious control that humans want to exercise over the rest of nature is sometimes analyzed precisely in terms of ambition and hubris, the pernicious side effects of the natural and welcome strived to, uh, to fame. In the poem, The Poetry's Hasty Resolution, Cavendish's hasty act of publishing her poems in the name of authorial fame is confronted by a personified reason. Reason is dissatisfied with Cavendish's decision to publish an unpolished work because, as reason ultimately seems to observe, publication is insufficient. The same idea is carried further in the poem, The, uh, the Common Faith of Books. Writing a book of philosophy would be simply insufficient. Most books are anyway destined to perish in the vaults of libraries, she'll, she'll claim. Instead, Cavendish symbolizes attaining authorial fame with the work of a spider building a cobweb. What we make of this? Well, to Cavendish sense and reason have voluntary actions. Voluntary actions are free insofar as they are self-actions. There is of course a lot of dispute over what this actually means. But for my purposes here, let's understand them as actions free from external constraints. Now, under Cavendish's account of occasional causes, in a strict sense, the actions of the effective parts, the creatures of natures, will ultimately be free of external constraint. So this, there is something more to these voluntary actions when compared with the occasioned or the patterned actions. What's more is that these voluntary actions are described as actions by rote. Now, one way to read this would be to put the emphasis on these voluntary actions by rote as actions done by custom, from habit, from memory, some sort of mechanical repetitions. But as Deborah Boyle also observes, I take it that for Cavendish, the more interesting and distinguishing factor is that voluntary actions by rote are actually done in the absence of anything external. The, they are voluntary actions because they are done without taking any copies of foreign objects. So both sensitive and rational matter enjoy such voluntary actions. Frequent examples of sensitive voluntary actions that Cavendish analyzes in detail are dreams, distempers, madness, etc. Rational voluntary actions, she gives examples, and there are many, conceptions, fancies, thoughts, imaginations. Actions in which rational matter moves independently of these sensitive motions will just qualify basically as voluntary actions. I would like to suggest that, however, unlike sensitive voluntary actions, some of, some, some of the rational voluntary actions can be reduced to the compounding of previously patterned figures. Some will turn out to be literal novelties. I cannot dream of an absolute novelty. Whatever I dream will, will end up being decomposable back to some copies of sensitive matter that you know, were patterned at some point from the outside. 
I am merely compounding such patterns in dreams. But I think Cavendish believes that I can rationally create a novelty. The rational matter can literally give birth to genuine, genuinely novel thoughts. Of course, the world most of the times will behave deterministically, but sometimes there will be leaps through such rational new productions. The inchoate suggestion I'm trying to propose today, and it's very inchoate, is that through her commitment to an infinitely varied matter endowed with sense and reason, Cavendish is also trying to allow for a genuine creativity within rational matter. This is of course a mere suggestion, but one which could explain why, for instance, in the PPO, Cavendish claims that as bodies procreate, so do minds. Uh, treating the process of rational creation as a procreation is informative in a sense. Each of us is of course the offspring of our parents, but none of us would consider ourselves as reducible to the set of inherited traits from our parents, nor do we take our being to be reducible to theirs. That is, we're not reducible to the patterns of other things. The same goes for these procreative thoughts, whichever they might be. A procreative thought is genuinely a novel thought and has its own being. As Cavendish puts it, the rational animal matter creates figures in the brain after its own invention. He wouldn't be too much of a stretch to compare these voluntary actions of rational matter to cases of spontaneous generation in nature, maggots generated from cheese, stones in a bladder, and so on. Sometimes Cavendish suggests that spontaneous generation is a genuine possibility. A novel thought is the spontaneous generation of the mind. Such concepts, conceptions will also be authored. No one can have a genuine conception that belongs to someone else. After all, they are given birth in one's mental womb via one's own idiosyncratic way of fusing or composing thoughts. There will be a distinction between additions or subtractions of thoughts, processes she talks about in the PPO, and this fusing or composing, which will result in a new unity, or so I'm suggesting. If these suggestions are somewhat suggestible, this tells us something about Cavendishian fame. It can tell us what it takes to produce a material trace of yourself that has the possibility of living on after the disintegration of your body as yourself through thought. Any material trace, such as a book, is always going to be produced by the sensitive matter or with the help of sensitive matter, that is. But what occasions it can, be di can differ. When the production of some material thing is occasioned by the free actions of your rational matter, its material is the material trace of you. When it's occasioned by the pattern of some external thing or someone else's rational matter, it's material trace of something other than you. This is what I take to be going on when Cavendish requires fame to be obtained through specifically personal traces. A material trace of certain free actions of your rational matter is a material trace of you specifically. And through this trace, you will live on so long as it, it, your trace occasions thoughts in the minds of others. In this way, the spider web will grow. And maybe the remarks that she sometimes makes about the degrees of, of resistance of a spider web will be or can be likened to the systematicity of such a thought. If Cavendish managed to write books on the basis of a genuinely creative thought, and I, I'd say she did, then she left behind material traces specifically of herself. We now read those books and they occasion actions of our own rational and sensitive matter. In this way, Cavendish specifically lives on. Finding these genuine acts of creative thought and showing how they create cob cobwebs is how Cavendish thought our thought one is destined to avoid being buried in the monuments of other writers. Her materialism of sense and reason is tailored such that it allows for such infrequent cases of genuine creative thought. It is in this act of creative thought that she sought to find and receive praises for her natural wit. She frantically writes in the pursuit of these very infrequent instances of creativity. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Um, I have been thinking a lot about Cabinet and Fame, so I really enjoyed that. Uh, but I also really liked how um, our two first presentations have kind of touched on some of the order and disorder uh, that we talked about last week with Olivia's. And then uh, Laura, how your presentation really picked up on the thread of individuation and uh, how we know or preserve what is individually us. Um, and what I'm excited for as well is that I think your thought on preservation and sort of living on in after ages, uh, I think will productively dovetail with our third presentation, which is very much on procreation and book children and all of that good stuff. Um, so let me, uh, let me share my screen one last time so that Laura can introduce our final speaker. Laura, over to you. I, I think Sorry, it's not you, uh, Olivia. Yeah. <laughs> My yeah, bad. I, I've got it. <laughs> um, wonderful. So our next speaker will be Lynn Maxwell. Lynn Maxwell is Associate Professor of English Literature at Spelman College, where she teaches classes in early modern literature. Her research interests include gender and sexuality, post-humanism, and emergent scientific thought in the period. Recent publications include her book, Wax Impressions, Figures and Forms in Early Modern Literature, Waxworks, and articles in the Journal for Early Modern, Cultural Studies, and Criticism. Today, Lynn will be looking at the distinctions that Cavendish draws between patterning and generation in her philosophical letters, and how those possibilities relate to thoughts, books, and children. So over to you, Lynn. Great. Um, sorry, I'm very talented at this zooming. <laughs> Okay, um, so yeah, I, I do think that um, my presentation today has a lot um, to say in conversation with the presentations we've already seen and particularly with Laura's. So I'm excited to see the conversations that we have. Um, so in past work on Margaret Cavendish, I have considered her concept of patterning as a mode of relation that resists the binaries of active and passive, and by extension challenges traditional concepts of gender. In her philosophical letters, Cavendish rewrote, rewrites the trope of signet seal, a trope famously bound up in metaphors of reproduction in the early modern period, to invest in agency in all positions. As she explains, if a seal be printed upon wax, Tis true, it is the figure of the seal which is printed on the wax, but yet the seal doth not give the wax the print of its own figure, but it is the wax that takes the print or pattern from the seal and patterns or copies it out in its own substance. Lynn, may, I, may I pause you briefly, Lynn? We're yeah. not seeing your slides at this point. Were you I'm not seeing my slides? Could you try that one more time? Sorry for the interruption. Sorry. It says it's failed to start. <laughs> Um, all right, let me try something else. I'll just restart it. Um, yeah, would you mind just restarting it from just clicking share screen? And now we're seeing, perfect, we're seeing your, your slides. Okay. And so when I go into this mode, can you still see it? Now we're good, thank you so much. Okay. Okay. I don't know why that didn't work. I'm so sorry for the interruption. Um, do you wanna start back up from the start or? Uh, sure. I mean, or pick back up from where you start, where you were. Okay. I don't want. I'll figure it out. Um, okay. So I'll just start after the after the quote. Um, and so, if you go read my book, I talk a lot about the role of wax and seals as this trope um, for reproduction. Um, but so I came at this paper. Um, sort of sideways going, okay, so that was fine and good, but what happens if we actually pay attention to what she has to say about generation instead of just how she's using this trope that normally has to do with generation, but she's not really using it for that. Um, so by reimagining the exchange between wax and seal in terms of patterning, Cavendish creates space for female agency, particularly around reproduction. But this space, suggestive as it might be, does not actually represent Cavendish's understanding of conception. 
Instead, when she explicitly considers generation elsewhere in the philosophical letters, she explains that they do not proceed through patterning, but through a different deeper process that requires the impartation of both matter and motion. The action of patterning is without translation, for to pattern out is nothing else but to imitate and to make a figure in its own substance or parts of matter like another figure. But in generation, every producer does transfer both matter and motion, that is corporeal motion into the produced. And if there be more producers than one, they, do all, they all do contribute to the produced. And if one creature produces many creatures, those many creatures do partake more or less of their producer. So reproduction for Cavendish is an act of creation that goes beyond mere copying. To generate a new creature, the producers must transfer both matter and motion and materially contribute to the act of creation. Interestingly, neither the number or sex of the producers is specified here. Cavendish does not discard the possibility of parthenogenesis or limit the number of producers to two. Instead, generation is offered as an expansive natural process that is different from patterning primarily because of its transformative nature. This vision of generation, which she develops in philosophical letters, is consistent with Cavendish's larger insistence that everything is material, new matter cannot be created, and that all matter is self-moving. Her ideas around these questions are, of course, not in line with her peers. Indeed, the philosophical letters proceeds as a series of responses to questions about more famous works of natural philosophy. Thus, Cavendish's ideas are always offered in conversation. In our discussion of generation, she is responding to William Harvey's anatomical exhortations concerning the generation of living creatures. Harvey, unable to observe what happens after sex and before a visible fetus in the dissections that he performed, theorizes that conception might occur via an immaterial transmission from the man. Quote, for there is nothing to be found abiding in the womb after coition, for the geniture of the male doth either suddenly fall out again or vanish away and the blood doth circulate again from the uterus by the vessels. Without an observable material cause for the formation of the fetus, Harvey concludes that the womb must work like the brain. For as we, from the conception of the form or idea in the brain, do fashion a form like to it in our works, so doth the idea or species of the genitor residing in the uterus by the help of the formative faculty, beget a fetus like the genitor himself, namely by implanting that immaterial species which it hath upon its workmanship. Generation then proceeds as the builder built, wrecks a house according to his preconceived, okay. pre-received conception. The exact relationship between the uterus and brain in Harvey's work is a bit ambiguous. Mental conception is both metaphor and more than metaphor as the appetites of the brain become the appetites of the uterus and take on generative power. Yet Harvey insists that the man must be responsible for the act of authorship and prove the genitor, even as he grasps for a mechanism to explain how that might be accomplished. Of course, Cavendish disagrees with Harvey about how conception occurs, in both brain and womb. She explains, conceptions of the brain, in my opinion, are not immaterial, but corporeal. For though the corporeal motions of the brain or the matter of its conceptions is invisible to humane creatures, and that when the brain is dissected, there is no such matter found, yet that does not prove that there is no matter because it is not so gross a substance as to be perceptible by our exterior senses. Where for Harvey, both mental and reproductive conception have immaterial instigators, Cavendish insists on the materiality of thought and by extension, everything else. Instead of thinking with Harvey about what might be visible within a dissected womb, Cavendish imagines the dissection of a brain and suggests that such an exercise would be futile because of the limits of our exterior senses. Indeed, for Cavendish, our inability to perceive thoughts is hardly remarkable, given that most of nature's works are not so gross as to be subject to our exterior sense. The human body may be dissectable, the brain observable, but such observations are largely irrelevant to understanding the, work, the workings of nature. Yet while Cavendish disagrees with Harvey about the value of dissection, the materiality of thought, and the process of generation, she seems to concur that there is something fundamentally similar between a conception in the brain and natural product productions or generations. She continues, 
Neither will your author's example hold that as a builder erects a house according to his conception in the brain, the same happens in all other natural productions or generations. For in my opinion, the house is materially made in the brain. That is, the house, when it is conceived in the brain, is made by the rational corporeal figurative motions of their own substance or degree of matter. But if all animals should be produced by mere fancies, and a man and a woman should beget by fancying themselves together in copulation, then the produced would be a true platonic child. But if a woman, being from her husband, should be so got with child, the question is whether the husband would own the child. And if amorous lovers, which are more contagious for appetite and fancy than married persons, should produce children by immaterial contagions, there would be more children than parents to own them. Where Harvey suggests that we might understand generation as being like workmen executing the builder's plan, Cavendish objects by arguing that it that in conceiving the house, the builder has already materially made it in the brain, or rather that the rational corporeal figurative motions of the brain's matter have made it. For Cavendish, these acts of conception and construction would most like, be, likely proceed either via a self-guided figurative moment, movement or patterning, not generation. However, even as she dismisses the possibility of all animals being produced by minds, she seems excited by that possibility. And the lines between mind and womb, thought and child seem tenuously upheld. Conceptions of the mind cannot explain babies or animals, but might their products be like children? If the difference between generation and other movements is the transference of corporeal motion, might that be accomplished by the mind? And if the products of the mind are too airy for human perception, how do we know that we have not produced an abundance of ethereal offspring who in turn might be producing their own? Certainly this possibility seems an open question in Cavendish's philosophy. In Observations Upon Experimental Philosophy, she again considers the relationship between the production of thoughts and the production of children. This time she is in the process of explaining how matter consists of an admixture of rational, sensitive, and inanimate parts. Such a mixture is necessary to balance and poise nature's actions that otherwise the creatures which nature produces would all be produced alike and in an instant. For example, a child in the womb would as suddenly be framed as it is figured in the mind, and a man would be as suddenly dissolved as a thought, but sense and reason perceives that it is otherwise. While Cavendish is attentive to the differences in how children and thoughts manifest in the world and the permanence of their existence, here the children, child in the womb sits comfortably alongside ones figured in the mind and both ask to be acknowledged even if only temporarily. Indeed, Cavendish seems most uncomfortable with the idea that mental conception and bodily conception might mix. She's very interested in rejecting theories of maternal impression and with them the idea that desire might shape the womb or secure its successes um, while she has no problem imagining these different types of generation as long as they don't mix. Uh, the possibilities of alternative offspring recurs in Cavendish's conceptualization of books as children. Books, of course, offer one way to solve the shortcomings of conceptions of the brain. They are more slowly realized, have longer lifespans, and are more readily perceivable due to their more substantial materiality. In her poems and fancies, she writes, condemn me not for making such a coil about my book, alas, it is my child. And again, in the grounds of natural philosophy, she asks the learned societies of Europe to be propitious to the birth of this beloved child of my brain. In the same introduction, she claims the right to be a fond and doting mother to her philosophical work, explaining it is so commonly the error of indulgent parents to spoil their children out of fondness that I may be forgiven for spoiling this and never putting it to suck at the breast of some learned nurse. While the trope of book as child and child as book is frequently deployed in the 17th century, Cavendish pursues it, pushes it further than most by rendering it physical via the reference to suckling. And when read alongside her philosophy, these claims seem to become more than metaphor. Indeed, her literary works repeatedly ask about the possibility of creating an enduring legacy by means other than biological reproduction. In Youth, Glory, and Death Banquet, one of Cavendish's closet dramas, the play opens with a debate about the education of father love and mother's love's only child, a daughter named San Perel. Mother love accuses father love of being an overly strict, um, of being overly strict and raising her on books and worries that the only happiness such an education might bring 
uh, her daughter is to walk idly about the Elysium fields. She concludes, thus you breed your daughter as if your posterity were to be raised from a poet's fantastical brain. At stake in this accusation is an implicit claim by mother love that the kind of education being provided here will not lead to grandchildren, at least not fleshy ones. Instead, Sam Perel will be capable only of producing poetry herself, or perhaps in reading so much poetry, Sam Perel might become herself a creation of poetry, which of course she already is insofar as she is a character of Cavendish's imagining. While mother love means to be dismissive here, a poet's posterity seems an acceptable outcome in the play. Father love exclaims, I wish my posterity may last as long as Homer's lines. And while mother love scoffs that truly will, it will be a fine airy brood, neither San Perel nor her father are concerned about that airiness. Later in the play, Sam Perel explicitly asks if her father will think her unnatural if she fails to provide it with grandchildren, and he scoffs, unnatural? No. And for my posterity, I had rather it should end with merit than run on in follies. Buoyed by this response, Sam Perel reveals her plan never to marry and instead live a virgin life devoted to study, oration, authorship, and fame. Given the trajectory of Cavendish's own life, it is hardly surprising that she celebrates Sam Perel's choices here and advances the value of alternative offspring or of a posterity not rooted in flesh. We might also think of the blazing world, which substitutes world creation for motherhood and indeed scarcely considers the possibility of children and imagining what the lives of women might look like. Read together, Cavendish's fiction and natural philosophy ask us to take seriously these various kinds of conception, their relation to each other, and their place in structuring human relations. Her response to Harvey de-emphasizes the role of gender in generation, shifting away from a consideration of male ejaculate and the female womb to a consideration of the brain and to a purposefully ungendered generative process. Um, she literally calls the womb the place of architecture. <laughs> um, Thus, for Cavendish, the roles of men and women become arbitrary and cultural rather than natural. She also begins to destabilize the idea that bodily human reproduction is the most important kind of reproduction, or even the dominant way in which humans reproduce. Thought babies outnumber their grosser counterparts, and these airy offspring or their more hefty counterparts orations in books might prove better conduits for securing a lasting futurity beyond one's own biological limits in the form of fame or poetic glory. More than that, if as the blazing world suggests, we might be able to generate not only conceptual offspring, but also entire worlds, each every bit as material as our own, our attention to the production and maintenance of fleshy families might be entirely misplaced. That's all. <laughs> um, our, our numbers are always uh, so strong and it's difficult to necessarily cobble a, a whole conversation together. Um, but I think I, it looks like we are still missing quite a few people, maybe from one room. Am I right? No, I think we're all here. Okay, never mind. Um, at this point, Olivia, do you want to do you want to take over and start kind of moderating a larger discussion? Maybe starting with each uh, asking kind of each moderator from each breakout room to quickly summarize what was going on. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. Yeah, I would love to hear from the moderators, um, you know, a quick report on the discussion that each of the rooms had. David, maybe we could start with us. Yeah, you bet. I was in Lynn's room. Uh, Karen asked a really good, interesting question about epistemological question about Cavendish and the limits to what we can know and how that would apply to her views on gender, uh, how, how, what we can know, I think, in that regard. Uh, Jennifer asked a really good question about the, the role that others played uh, as, a, as a kind of co copulation when Cavendish's ideas were, were produced and, and when they were they kept where they remained in existence, right? And maybe William Cavendish played a role or maybe some others. Uh, and then E uh, asked a really good question about uh, the focus uh, that uh, Lynn had on philosophical letters. Uh, and then I know you pushed the question about the relationship between the literary text and the philosophical text that was really helpful. Thank you so much. Wow, so many intriguing things to consider there. Um, who was another? Can I nominate Leanne from our room? 
Sure. Yeah. Um, it was a it was a really fascinating discussion and um, picking up a little bit on this idea um, between um, uh, the co connection potentially between creativity and genre. We were focused more on talking about um, uh, Cavendish's philosophical views of fame and her her notion of trying to mark herself out as having a particular lineage in philosophy, uh, in her philosophy, and how she goes about how she might go about distinguishing her own views. Um, and we were struck by the tension, as um, as um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure out who said what. <laughs> we were struck by the tension, uh, as 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 it, as Laura put it, between the sort of um, uh, a, a mode of of creation that that uh, articulates a, a cap, it puts Cavendish as a as a singularity, uh, versus the the potential for that that drive to fame to create um, to to just uh, dissolve in in ambition and, and hubris, um, and. Uh, I know we finished up with a really interesting question um, from Tanya that we didn't quite <laughs> manage to to uh, to to um, finish talking about, but the the idea that there's a danger in living in other people's minds and that um, imitation uh, and and fancy are connected, but not every it's, there's potentially not every material thought could be could be replicated. I wonder if it's, it's possible maybe for Laura to to finish up now. Uh, what her answer was going to be to Tanya. Yeah, by all means, Laura, I'd love to. Oh, uh, okay. I, I'm not even muted, so I guess right. it's not an issue. I could just talk. No, so Tanya really asked a question of, from a part of the reading that I sort of assigned for today in which uh, Cavendish is distinguishing between all those, providing various definitions for arts, practice, sciences, invention, fancies. And she has this idea that there are some subtle, very subtle motions of the rational matter that could never be put into sensitive motions. And these, I think, that is, I think, part of the definition of the fancies. And she was wondering, does that suggest in a way that maybe they're not immaterial, but you know, how do we deal with these? Like, how do we think about, you know, very speculative imaginations? And I think there is something to be said precisely to this point that, in you know, not all motions of the rational matter will have sensitive patterns they, they not all can be sensitively patterned and i mean you know you could think about some of the I, I suspect even you know some of the logic or mathematics not that that would be cavendish's example but even if you think about logic or mathematics those would not necessarily become uh subjects to the sensitive prints and I don't know exactly, you know, which fancies, whether they're like poetical fancies that Cavendish has in, in mind there when she provides a definition, but it's definitely the case, I, I think, I'm, I'm very definitive sometimes, but it's just a, just a rhetorical move really. Um, it is. It does seem sometimes that Cavendish is willing to claim that some of the motions of the rational matter, especially the voluntary uh, motions of the rational matter will not necessarily need to have a um, sensitive pattern in, so they will not necessarily need to exist in the world in whatever, you know, as parts of our, of, of the emotions of the sensitive matter or as parts of the prints that other creatures can make of these, uh, the sensitive, sensitive prints that other creatures can make of these voluntary rational matter. So maybe there's a way in which you can talk, you could say that the, our own rational matter will talk with the rational matter of other people. That reminds me of some questions we had in our room about the relationship between fancy and reason and how they both are described as operations of rational matter. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that or has thoughts about that, but it was something that we were trying to, to get clear on in our room and also like the question of, and I think what you were pointing out, Laura, that uh, about how, um, certain rational motions can't be patterned out by sensitive matter or can't be um, in Cavendish's sense transferred to, I guess, um, sensitive matter gets at another question we had in our room about like, what impact will fancies have on other things in the world once they're expressed in textual form or expressed in some other form? So it seems like one thing you're saying is, and this makes sense, 
that there's some element that is going to remain almost intrinsic, but maybe that's not what you're saying. Maybe what you're saying is there is a way for the rational matter and different individuals to communicate these very subtle motions. But I wonder, I'm, I'm not being very clear at this point, but I wonder whether this could also be understood with reference to um, what Cavendish has to say about like interior figurative motions that can't be penetrated or sort of understood from the outside. Does that make any sense? Yeah, but I wouldn't know how to answer this question. I guess my well, for initial way of approaching it would be to ask myself, well, what does she say about copying fancies? Can actually can fancies, qua fancies, be copied? Or is there something else going on? You know, if I'm if I am reading Cavendish's poems, which were allegedly these fancies kind of somehow arise. And, you know, maybe I am actually never being able to copy her fancy. So I don't know. I think there's if I have no idea how to approach this question. But I think if we take seriously that definition, which Tanya pointed us to, then the next question would be to say, well, by what would be the mechanism of replication of these fancies? And I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, the comment in the chat is making me think of another question that I had during your talk, actually, Laura, when you were describing this phenomenon that a friend can live on in your memory, but it's just going to be almost like a patchwork of different parts of the friend, an edited version. It's not gonna be a copy of them in their fullness, as it were. Um, and I was wondering also whether we could understand Cavendish's impulse to publish so much, like not only in terms of this like anxiety that, oh, nobody was gonna read her, she like had to do it, she was gonna run out of time, but also as an attempt to get many different versions of herself out there so that people would have in their minds more complex and perhaps more accurate images of her as a complex human being. But I don't know, maybe that's that's reading into it too much or being too generous. Well, so we had a similar, a short similar discussion during the break room about this as well. And I do think that, you know, um, while there are thematic uh, relationships between genres. I think Cavendish does think that there's something distinctive to, you know, putting your uh, fancies and your ideas into poetry versus in, in, into her version of natural philosophical in versus philosoph uh, well, philosophical letters and so on. But uh, so I think there is something to be said to that point. But I have to, you know, just to put the, all the cards on the table, my idea of a copy is never a copy, <laughs> a perfect copy comes from a very, uh, I, I have a commitment, which, you know, I probably should be more better at um, arguing for that in Cavendish holds, th there's never the possibility of a whole interacting with another whole, and you never are able to pattern a whole. So you're always, always going to just pattern out uh, parts of whatever object is in front of you, whether it's because you're doing it just in terms of, you know, your eyes and not your, 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 you know, I don't know, your, the smell, like me, for instance, right now I have no smell, but it's not COVID, so it's fine, um, you know, like, there's there is something like that that is going on in there so then you do have to the rational matter does have to put all these uh you know patterned um yeah all of these patterns together and create uh the alleged copy of the friend something like this yeah there is some information loss yeah tanya yeah did you want to jump in yeah, thank you so much. Um, I that was such a helpful response, Laura. I really appreciate that. And and I wondered actually if we could connect this to this discussion to Lynn's paper. Um, Lynn, when you were talking about the builder already making the you know the architecture in the mind, I was just so struck. I mean, drama traditionally depends upon embodiment, and of course, for Cavendish, you know, material bodies bodies are material in her brain, but it just seems like drama, um, and, and I know there's been discussion in, in Cavendish's, in scholarship on Cavendish's plays about uh, their performance in her time and, you know, what what their status is as closet dramas or, you know, but I just, I just wonder if you might also um, comment on the dramatic plays and sort of if it matters 
if it's the same kind of thing happening in the reader's mind as someone watching a play? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're right that there there would have to be a very strong connection. But then it, again, like it, it matters. You could argue it matters what the matter is, right? So when she's talking about the the builder already um, conceiving, materially making the house in the brain, um, but not using, I didn't read the part, but not using stone, brick, and wood, but instead the materials of the mind, right? Like I think there's an important distinction for her there, which, I mean, reading it against that idea of performance, it almost seems as though it would be better for the reader to create, um, to pattern out these figures in the mind, because um, the mind, I think, is a more privileged kind of material for Cavendish um, than, than to have actors perform it and to watch the actors, right? Like, that experience would be, I think, more profoundly transformative for the reader, potentially, than for the viewer, maybe. <laughs> That reminds me of a passage, I think, in Philosophical Letters, where she says, she clarifies her account of how an artifact um, has sense and reason. And she, said, she, she uses the example of a watch and says, of course, it has sense and reason, but not insofar as it's a watch that a person made, but insofar as it's made of natural materials. So that suggests to me that, um, like you're saying, the mental version of a play wouldn't be the perfect material analog of a play performed in, in um, the outside world or whatever. But like you suggested, Lynn, we can look at, okay, well, what is the nature of the matter that's doing this figuring? And if it's rational, primarily rational matter, that seems to elevate it to a pretty high status. Um, I selfishly wanted to go back to something that David mentioned, um, his room discussing. I was wondering if we could, if I could hear a little bit more about this question of Cavendish and epistemology, um, how she thinks there are limits to what we can know and how that could work with gender. So I don't know if anybody wants to expound on that a little bit, or if anyone who wasn't in the room wants to comment on it. I just think that's a really interesting issue. Um, I'd like to hear your, your all's thoughts. I think we sort of wished you were in the room to comment on that, Olivia. I mean, I sort of gestured at your paper <laughs> and trying to answer that um, because I think that's a place where there's an interesting intersection between your question about, well, how do you even know where a self ends and the sort of other question of, well, what would a gen what would a performance of a particular gender look like? Like why, why doesn't Cavendish sometimes label some people masculine, for example, like what does that mean given all the variety that she has everywhere, um, like both within the self um, and in types of selves um, that she sort of then reasserts this binary. So I would love to hear what you have to say. Well, I think that there's so much to consider there. I can't promise that my response will be very satisfactory, but one thing it does make me think of is how common it is to encounter her commenting upon the ignorance between human creatures and other kinds of creatures. So she's very convinced, right, as I said in my paper, that there are things that we don't know or don't understand or can't perceive or however you want to put it that are going on in, this, in, in, in other kinds of creatures. But what I'm now thinking about is like how that's true within the category of human creatures as well, right? Like it's not as though we can perfectly know each other, which fits with what Laura um, and Tanya were just discussing. And even as um, I think Laura, this also relates to a point that you make in that paper of yours that I talked about briefly in the talk, that ignorance is actually ontological for Cavendish. Like it's built into how she understands the distinction between individuals. Um, and so, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure what to make of that, except for that it does make me wonder what potential might exist to think about gender as something indeterminate or something that, you know, certainly you can't know with certainty when it comes to another person. 
Um, and that fits with the suggestion that I make at the end of the paper that like maybe there is something a little bit indeterminate about this, partly because of the elements of her philosophy that build in skepticism or indeterminacy. Um, yeah, so I just think that's really interesting. And I had been thinking mostly about the ways in which human creatures sort of fail to get right the complexity and sophistication of non-human creatures. But now I'm thinking, well, that applies to people, you know, to individuals within the category of humans as well. And that's such a productive suggestion. So thanks. And I'll go ahead and just chime in. Uh, Leon went ahead and wrote in the chat that Laura made a similar point in our discussion. Cavendish argues that non-human creatures and also maybe rocks <laughs> may have a similar drive for fame, but that drive is unknowable to us as humans. Uh, though Cavendish certainly co-ops metaphors of creation from bees, spiders, et cetera. So uh, epistemology from different perspectives, I guess. I just wanted to um, speak briefly. I know we only have a few minutes left, but I was so struck by that line in some of our readings for today. And I think they were the fame readings, the chapter that ends on the sentence, in short, God lives no other ways among his creatures, but in their rational thoughts and sensitive worship. I thought that was a really interesting moment where it seems that God only lives through fame. Um, and therefore, that kind of puts everybody who lives it on in that same way, um, on the same, in the same sort of realm of being as the divine. I don't know if um, people have something to say about that, but that struck me as a really interesting moment. Yeah, I mean, it's the complicated issues in it because by the time, I mean, by the time we move to the sort of later writings of Cavendish, it does become very clear that for some reason or other, I think it's a question here, she is quite adamant on the fact that we have um, sort of an idea of the existence of God that is innate. And we also have an self, a love for God that is also innate to creatures. So insofar as that, not to creatures, to every single part of matter. So in, insofar as that's the case, there's no really no need for the replicate for a, you know, a, a fame mechanism because there's something that no one can escape, whether you're a rock or human, you know, an embryo, whatever you are, this in, innate idea will be there with you. So it's it's an interesting, I don't know if it's a shift or if this is also how we are supposed to read it in the context of the world's olio, because a lot of the times that's what's going on with Cavendish. It's, it's sometimes she's not really carrying the idea to, to, to till the end. She sometimes just smuggles in another idea and between the comas, there's, there's you know, she talks about, Oh, everything is through remembrances or, you know, coma, imagination. And you're thinking, no, nah, remembrances is not the same thing as imagination, but it's there, it's smuggled in. She does this all the time. So it's very difficult. It's a decision that I think as the reader, you have to make into, is this part of the, you know, the, the argument or is she adding a new idea here where she's basically just suggesting to us that God is just something, it's in a way similar to fame because it has, it, you know, it's already there. It, it is, it, it continues to exist, but it already, it continues to exist as part in every single, as, as a part in every single part of creature, of, of nature, because, it, you know, it, it is an innate idea. But I don't know much about Gavendish and the way she thinks about God, in, especially in the early writings. Martine, there's a great quote from Poems and Fancies at the end of one of the prefaces where she says um, that she's not going to talk about God because she's struck with awe and fear and reverence. Uh, but it, it actually ends with exactly what you were saying, which is, for God and his heavenly mansions are to be admired and wondered at with astonishment and not disputed on. So there's a sense in which, like, if you do have fame, if you are this creature of wonder and astonishment and awe, uh, then you don't get to be a topic of conversation. Uh, and it's odd to think of Cavendish as, as desiring that kind of fame or that kind of awe and that kind of wonderment, although she often does perform that. Um, but of course she does want to be disputed, you know, disputed about. So in some ways, leaving God as the ur fame kind of position makes her available as, as a creature of fame that it is okay to be, <laughs> to be disputed. Or not. At least I hope it's okay, because we've done about two hours of that. Um, I'm going to bring us to a wrap just because we, we do need to close at a point. 